Hey everyone, welcome uh, to the Cyberman Show. Today I have uh, a good old friend of mine, Vishwami Chavla. Uh, I will ask him to get, start with his introduction, but today we will talk about data privacy. It's a very interesting topic. It's getting a lot of attention from our uh, government as well as governments uh, in uh, and out of Europe. Specifically, Europe is a, a sensitive area. So the countries are coming up with their data privacy and data security law. So I thought we'll get an expert to talk about this. Vishwamit, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Thank you, Prashant. It's been, it's been a while that we connected um, and, and uh, it's, it looks surreal. A um, lot of memories to, yes. to cherish and a lot of memories uh, together. Uh, yeah. We all started in 2002. Uh, mm. as you can remember the days we started with uh, obviously you were not a part of what i started with in 2002 but what i did was uh, to support uh, the contact center uh, uh, customers of hp in 2002 and then mm. obviously ended into cyber security with you which mm. was at safenet uh, yes we supported the worldwide customers of safenet at that point in time um, it was it was good experience as such. Just the first foray into the cybersecurity world. Yes. Uh, thereafter, did a lot of things at the client side, and then thereafter worked with you again in RSA, which was again a great experience. Yes. Um, the RSA product line was uh, having everything, which uh, uh, all the cybersecurity um, domain has uh, in effect. So. We did all of that, learned a lot, figured out where we are into that world and did a few certifications uh, within that uh, experience, mm -hmm. uh, worked out my CISP, CISA and, and, and uh, CCSK, you know, those certifications definitely help. So anybody mm -hmm. listening new uh, and wanting to start uh, their journey into cybersecurity, I would highly recommend that they do have certifications uh, in their point of view, in their horizon mm. to get through. And then obviously landed into this job, uh, the mm. last one before doing a few gigs in HCL and Wipro. Uh, this was into privacy, into data security, the domain that we'll be speaking right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we'll come on to the subject matter, how is it different and how is it aligned to cybersecurity? All of that could be di discussed uh, in mm. a while, um, but, just to give you a few, um, few Wait, things. Mean, I'll, 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 sorry for mm -hmm. interrupting you, but I I wanted to know because I have a perspective on how we landed into cybersecurity. Did you know that you were getting into cybersecurity? I did not. I started my life as a hardware engineer, right? <laughs> then, <laughs> then because of good reading habits, I moved into cybersecurity. It was exciting. So what about you? Now, that's a good point. That's a very good point. Um, obviously, now uh, the Gen Z and Gen Ys and the newer generation plan it out completely where they want to land up. Mm. And it's a case of where you're sitting on the Maslow's triangle, as people say, right? Mm. So um, I planned that I should be in computers, mm. but I never planned that I would be in cybersecurity. Mm. So as you rightly said, um, I never planned out after my first job that I'm going to be landing up in cybersecurity. The only thing that got me into it was understanding how the Wi-Fi world works because that's what I supported. Yes. And that's where I got to know there is SSID, there is some kind of security that has to play its, play its role for the Wi-Fi to get connected. That was mm -hmm. the only, only link that I had from the, my first job which was to support the HP's Wi-Fi customers. Mm -hmm. And then onto the second job, which was to support the SafeNet customers. <laughs> yes. So obviously it wasn't planned, as you said, that's, uh, that's a good one, yeah. Yeah, and also what amazes me today is, is how easy it is to get into cyber security now. There's a lot of content uh, available on internet. There are a lot of books available. Uh, I remember when I started, nobody was using Google, right? There was nothing, all you had, you know, the CCNA books, the Cisco books, et cetera, that was the only thing uh, you could refer as the security thing there. Also networking and the product manuals. I still remember opening my first router, reading the hardware manual, right? How the ports are. But yeah, good old days, good old days. So yeah, good going, days. Absolutely. Yeah, go, going back to data privacy, okay? Uh, I've been hearing a lot about what our government is saying, but I wanted 
to learn more about data security and data privacy understand the difference and how is it more relevant in today's world and now what is uh, is happening one is the cyber security side people understand cyber security now compared to what uh, was happening in our days uh, um, let's say 10 years back also there is there's stuff getting developed in metaverse right the entire vr ar experience and then there is ai what chat gpt is doing is just amazing right what i don't trust is these data sources right so i'm sure data privacy is impact there so i wanted to hear your views on on uh, on that learn from you so i know you have prepared a presentation so please navigate us so i will um let's do this let me just share that presentation let's have that as the basis um mm -hmm. to just go through the different slides and and different uh, um point of views that i have here can you see my screen now i can thank you yes wonderful so i thought i'll i'll probably have a bit of an agenda to start with to answer the questions that you had and there is an interesting point to be that you brought in which is around chat gpt and the ai ml conundrum as we say uh, what does privacy hold there mm. uh, how is privacy affecting it or how will privacy affect it as well yes. what are what are certain peripheries that it is defining for ai ml to work within uh, that's very important mm -hmm. because at the end of it uh, for privacy what's at the center is the data subject or mm. the user mm. uh, all the rights all the laws that are there across the globe are because of that user that i've you're talking about mm -hmm. so i'm going to be just taking through this agenda which is just defining what personal data is then just a brief look at what the laws are across the globe which have got a ramification on to what data privacy is um we will also talk about what's different different between data security and data privacy and what's common between the two as well because okay. there's a lot that's common as such and then the two components majorly of data privacy um the technical controls which we call as privacy enhancing technologies okay. some of them are known as privacy enabling technologies as well because there's administrative controls there's policy based controls a lot of different things but where do you apply where do we apply technology is important for us to understand and that's where the maximum jobs the maximum um kind of avenues would be for the new new generation to look at okay so some important on, terms are you mm -hmm. saying if i learn data privacy as a youngster uh, i there is a better chance for me to get a new job is that what you're saying i i believe so okay. i believe so with dpa on the anvil okay uh, data privacy act or pdpa as, as they as they call it uh i think there would be a lot of jobs opening up and there's a legal angle to it as well and there oh, is yes. a technology angle i know well. lawyers who are doing data privacy specializations and they are uh, getting absolutely their, their specialization done in in cyber security which is amazing absolutely absolutely then i've got a i've got a quick point of view on pims which okay. i believe which i believe would be what ISMS was in 2013 14 and that led to a lot of different kinds of jobs thereafter um apart from legal and the technology implementation there is auditing work that people do on ISMS so pims would be for us now what ISMS what was say in 2013 14 so it's it's a very opportune time for the youngsters to think about privacy and how do people would get certified themselves as organizations against a framework of frameworks or a standard which is all encompassing of the different kinds of laws that are there across the globe so pims is that so i thought that's an important aspect that we could mm. we could have a talk about okay. quick benefits of it and then the use cases which would be interesting for people to look at because that's where the applicability of the theory comes in mm. Mm. So right. let me just quickly get to um this which is what is personal data because at the end of the day as i said at the crux of it at the center of it it is user it's the data subject um both gdpr and pims define this as some information which gives you 
the identification of the person or there is an inferential identification. So one is one-to-one -one mapping of the identification. Like for instance, your date of birth, uh, your orientation, uh, the place that you live in. And one could be the inferential identification, which could be sector 135, somebody with, who, who is working in an IT company. It is just an inferential identification. So context, as well as aggregation, comes into a lot of, lot of focus here. Because inference only comes in when you have a context around a person that could identify a person or an aggregation wherein your data at multiple places can be aggregated into one and then identify you. So both of this information is personal data. It is just not one-to-one -one mapping of a person's unique characteristics to the person. That's the personal data. It is inferential identification worked out through context and aggregation. That is also personal data. Okay, and- Now uh, let me just- uh, uh -huh. so so which I'm sorry, I'll, I'll keep asking questions. Sure. Perfect, yeah, that's right. perfectly okay. So GDPR and PIMS, what I understand, so uh, GDPR is a law, right? Around data yeah, privacy. Absolutely. Okay. And PIMS essentially is about, it It helps you identify the personal identity, identifiable information, which means I can trace who Vishwamit is by looking at or tracking things like email addresses, phone numbers, et cetera. Is that correct? So let me just, that's a good question. Let me try and make you make you figure out what GDPR or makes your viewers figure out what GDPR and PIMS are. GDPR, as you said, is a law. Mm -hmm. That's the most uh, pervasive in terms of the, um, not only the European region, but across the world as a law. Most of the laws that are made right now mm -hmm. have got a lot common from what GDPR has got. Okay. PIMS, it's because we, we exchange information with other countries because we are exporting importing products. It's important for in a company working in India to comply to regulation in uh, like GDPR, which is meant for Europe, but they are, have to do it because they are sending information to Europe or taking information from Europe. Is that correct? Not only that. Okay. That's a good point. It's transfer of information, which requires people to comply to different kinds of regulations within which they want to their businesses in, which are different regions. But also the concepts of GDPR are so, so, so pervasive, so vibrant that most of the laws would take knowingly, unknowingly things out of GDPR. So mm -hmm. for instance, if you've got a PDPA, I am 100% sure that there would be certain things which would overlap. Of course, of course. Now, PIMS, as I said, is ISO's standard for privacy, which is an extension to 27001, which we call as 27701. Mm. It works in addition to 27001. So if you are an organization, let's say you, from an organization from the information security group have implemented ISMS. You are certified ISO 27001 now. Hmm. What you would do additionally to make sure that your privacy certified, your controls are good enough for privacy specific purposes, then you'll get yourself certified to PIMS. Hmm. That's Got where it. I call all these laws at the end of it would get converged into PIMS for specifically for technical controls in okay. an organization. Understood, very clear. Great, um, so with that, let's just move to a, to, a, to a quick diagrammatic representation of where we are. And this is the United Nations Conference, that's the source. Hmm. This is just believe that privacy is still evolving, which may be true to an extent, but when you see this diagram, probably the application of privacy specific needs and the requirements for the organizations, governments is still evolving. But as a law, there's a lot that's already been developed. The 137 out of 194 countries now have a law, wow. which I'm sure you might not have even thought about that this is, Never. This is the picture. 
right. we would think about like you know 20 25% right now it's 70 71% which is which is a great coverage yes um we fall in the yellow segment we got a draft legislation for the last 3 years okay uh, but still to be implemented and then with no legislation it's about 15% and and with no data which probably i don't know which countries are these because at the end of it everybody is connected to internet <laughs> but there are some countries yeah. with no data which is 5% which is which would be good to double click and see who these countries are so, um, so mm-hmm. i i've got a question so sure uh, so does it matter to have a data privacy law why do i need a data privacy law as a country right there are 15% they don't care right why well, do i need a data privacy law why so i'll have a counter to you why do we need laws then and if 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 i could answer that myself at the end of it you would need laws to just make sure that um the rights that the people and the individual and the citizens of the countries have are being kind of followed are being maintained are being sustained yes within that jurisdiction so at the I end see. of it it's because of the rights that the individuals have you need to make sure that those rights are sustained and people have the rightful living with their rights in that jurisdiction i agree now so which means our constitution should be amended to include a data privacy right also right absolutely so now But, your information is your information yes and we need to make sure that it is sustained in a manner that it's not been used for frivolous purposes by anyone it could be you know the biggest of the organizations but at the end of it the citizens have to have that rightful right to make sure that their right is maintained mm. and sustained mm. so that's why we need a law that's okay. why we need data privacy law so in the most basic sense data privacy law allows a common citizen to control how uh their personal data is used uh by an a company who's taking that information right so absolutely right so this example is, whenever i apply yeah. for a home loan transfer they take my aadhar card they take my pan card uh, address proof my property document copy all that they take right and i have no idea where it is going so you're saying once we have absolutely. the draft legislation turn, turning into law i would exactly know who's processing that information i would have rights to tell them if i am ready to share it or not you know concepts like the vid in aadhar is amazing uh, you know i think everyone should use vid so i absolutely get the importance of a law thank you absolutely this is going to be the next fundamental right for all of us yes it's a human right right mm-hmm. to privacy as right to food right to water whatever we call is a fundamental right and we need a law to make sure that it's it's followed as it should be with within the jurisdiction agreed great so with that it's a good segue for me to get into what we had as as a, as a quick quick uh, discussion point at the beginning which is what's the difference between cyber security and privacy now i thought of having this venn diagram um wherein the common aspects have been in the middle while we have got the i shouldn't say disconnects but you know the differentials um just on the left and right as you face the screen so confidential information in you know in information security terms and we have been the students of this subject for a while it's all about cia confidentiality integrity and availability yes we really add to that non repudiation accountability and assurance and all of those other but at the end of it cia now what's confidential within information security may be personal to privacy but there could be a possibility that what's personal may not be confidential i could just give an example of a phone book okay that's personal information but it may not be confidential because at the end of it that's why that's been made for people to look at so that's where the difference is 
another difference mm-hmm. privacy to me because being a human right has got wider set of obligations so things like collection limitation of the information that you just talked about to the purposes that it's needed for hmm. right is a privacy aspect which is not a security aspect okay the relevancy of the information would be different for privacy than information security it could be same as well mm-hmm. right then so, the so, use limitation okay so let's say the audience of this uh, co- podcast is a college going student what's the simplest way for him to understand security versus privacy in his context let's take his uh, uh, college you know college identity student id card right is that uh, securing that is the job of their university i would assume right uh, absolutely student id number and so where how would you classify what is into security versus what's into privacy so well the cyber security aspects would aid the privacy to have that information secured if that information is confidential and personal oh okay okay so in in that context if a student identity can can help anyone identify his name his his home address and his mobile number and if we are securing that information so we are securing and also helping in privacy is that what you are saying absolutely okay. absolutely Point but eight. there could yeah. be information mm-hmm. like for instance um a person like me or the student go debate competition and then just forecasting or just publicizing um forecasting is the wrong word the publicizing is information across different forums hmm. now hmm. that's personal information right but still that needs to be conveyed to everyone hmm. so that's privacy but it is not cyber security that's needed to secure that information so some information which needs to be in the public domain may be personal information but it doesn't have the confidentiality connotation to it okay okay you may need to secure that information in the future by the identification pseudonymization anonymization other aspects but what i'm trying to convey is just in the information's perspective some information which is confidential may not be personal information but still get secured because it's how cyber security works it it has got uh, its own domain as well to cater to which is just secure information hmm. within that triad of cia okay but privacy is very specific to the personal information personal information yes very clear now um that's where i said if you would see on the right hand side there is this adage wherein you can have security without privacy but you cannot have privacy without security agreed absolutely right it, i i if you could just think about it just security is a subset of privacy because that has got wider ram wider ramifications as i said as i said it has got legal ramifications it has got something which is human to it it has got a um, lot of different other ramifications as well so that's where i think there is this difference between the two okay now what i thought was how do we how do we think about what privacy is that's also important while we have tried and worked out the delineation between cyber security and privacy what is privacy at the end of it so again the venn diagrams no intersection here these are two different aspects of privacy and i with purpose do not have an intersection here because these are two different things that's how people should understand this one is the data governance part of it which is around proper collection handling management and use of personal information that's where all of those things come in who processed it why did the person why did the processor process it what was the purpose with which the collection happened what kind of choices notices 
consents taken from the user while collecting the information. That's on the data governance side of it. Starting from the collection to possibly just going through the lifecycle management and just deleting that data or possibly de-identifying that data if not deletion is not a possibility. And the other part, which is data security, which is more organizational as a function wherein you apply cybersecurity. So it's proper protection of the personal data. And it's got ramifications around the techniques that are used to protect. And then thereafter, it leads you to save yourself and your organization from any kind of fines. Because most of the regulations help if, if the data is protected, you are saved from any kind of breach fines uh, if the data is breached even. Okay, so I have so, a question. Are you saying yes. that uh, data governance, good data governance leads to better data security? Uh, are, are these two mandatory? Uh, are they connected? How, how does that work together? Well, you could have that as a corollary, as a thought that good data governance leads to data security. That's, that's a given. But I'm just trying to put these two aspects in a different, in different circles. Just to give you a sense, on the left, which is data governance is what you collect is being maintained and sustained in a manner that it is secure and private for the person whom it is collected for. And on the other side, data security is more like an organizational objective on the data that is collected. Oh, okay. So whatever technical controls you would apply on the data governance side would be mostly the privacy technologies. Whatever you apply on the protection side would be cybersecurity technologies, if I could say so. Okay. Okay. So now I'm thinking, okay, this is exciting because for me, everything is, how is it contributing to the younger generation? So are you, do you believe there would be jobs like data officers, uh, chief data officers, privacy leader? Is that happening already or it's going to come? It is happening already. Okay. It is happening already because there is this mandate within GDPR. If you've got 250 odd people in your organization, and if you are a processor of personal information, you need to have DPOs. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Right. I didn't so know this. Could, this is good information. Yeah, that could be a, a, a great avenue for people to come in. I don't know what PDPS puts in within the Indian context. But if you are collecting the data within the European Union, which most of the MNCs are, uh, yes, then you need a DPO. So let's say there's a company in India, again, going back to the simpler example, uh, that is processing data or is exporting some stuff uh, to Europe and they are transmitting some information in, and they have headquarters out of India. Would they need a data privacy officer here or in Europe? Depends, where is the processing happening? Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Where is the processing happening? It all depends on that. Mm. So I, I clearly remember with one of our customers, I'm, I'm not going to take name. They process large amount of uh, data from both US and European customers. Uh, they are essentially a KPO, which is a new term for BPOs. Uh, right. And uh, these companies would need data privacy officers. Is that fair? Assumption? Absolutely, absolutely. So, so one is where the processing is happening. Two mm. is what's the structure that you follow for the privacy program, privacy governance within your organization. Okay. There is a possibility. Some of that would be very regional, mm. decentralized structure, wherein you would need these DPOs to be placed in wherever the data processing is happening, or it could be centralized as well. So it depends how the structure of the privacy team is constituted. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm asking too many questions. No, no. It's <laughs> perfectly okay. Of our content, yeah. but you know, it's all about learning, right? So these are, these are very, very pertinent to the audience that we're catering and yeah. the subject that's at hand. So in a nutshell, two different domains within privacy. One is very organizational. 
how the technologies get implemented by the organization, the perspective and the context is from the organization. One is very user specific, how the technologies get implemented, which is on the notice, choice, consent, cookie management, a lot of different things that the technologies get in, implemented on the data governance side. Okay. Um, well, this is, this is a quick slide, which I thought would be of help for people to understand where do these kinds of um, areas within technical control set, the technologies would apply to. So one of course is not, not the best way, it's the crude way of making sure that the personal data is made up secure, which is obfuscation. Um, I don't need to go deeper into that. You know, like masking, tokenization, yeah, randomization. Example, the you know, virtual ID in Aadhaar, right? Absolutely. You have an option to generate Absolutely. Aadhaar card with a VID, so your actual Aadhaar is never revealed. That's Absolutely. an example of Absolutely. obfuscation, right? Absolutely. Then we've got data minimization, which is a huge, huge requirement under privacy. So gone are the days when you know you you, you can have the data um, all the time, anywhere, on the tapes, um, and there's nothing that the organization would would need to pay for later. Mm -hmm. Now you have to have the data for specific purposes. One for a specific time period, two, and for, for a specific lawful basis as well. There's a difference between purpose and lawful basis. I can, we can talk about that, but important to understand that data minimization is a huge, huge area wherein technology needs to apply. Think about it. You know, even if you can't delete something on the backups that you have, you need to make sure that it is not made online in the future anytime if the user has chosen so. So there are rights within GDPR which makes the users decide what information lives with the organization, what doesn't. So okay. these, yeah, you got a question? Yes, uh, so minimization, give me an example and I need examples to understand, okay? Okay. So, uh, so for instance, um, Let's say um, you are a user of a social media platform, which most of the youngsters are. Yes. And you know, tomorrow you decide that I want to get out of that. Um, I want to approach that social media platform and say, um, I, I, I I have a right to be forgotten. Okay. That's that's like GDPR language or right to delete or whatever. Yes. We call that right to be forgotten. Okay. So, okay, hold on. In one of the common platforms, social media platforms, most now they have an option where you I can delete my account information, right? So are you telling me that even after deleting, they, the organization has the right to keep that information about me? Unless I that's choose what I'm saying. right to forgotten? Yeah, so you have okay. chosen. I'm just, I'm just trying to, trying to work this out with the most possible, generic um, concept that could appeal to the new, new, new generation, uh, our audience. So now you have got right to be forgotten. You have just said delete my data. Mm -hmm. Now you, th that delete of your data is just, just not the deletion of your data, which is for for the last three months, six months, or whatever. Yes, the social media platforms would also have their backup systems for mm. the data that's like five years old or 10 years old. Agreed. Now that data also needs to be either de-identified or deleted. Once you have chosen that you have to be completely out of that social media platform. It is not just the deletion of your identity specific uh, credentials but also the information that you have on that social media platform. So for that, you need a lot of technologies to be applied. And when the technologies have to be applied within that whole ecosystem, you need people to manage it. So data minimization is also an avenue wherein privacy needs have to be catered through people and the technology combo. Mm -hmm. 
Understood. Security is security, so I don't need to get deeper into it. We've talked about it, data security, all of those kinds of encryption. Yes. And this is something which has already been there. Yes. Uh, it's nothing that gets added. Data minimization is, of course, a new thing. And then we got another aspect which is coming up, which is around the newer technologies, which is very privacy specific. So you got this term like privacy by design, privacy by default wherein what you make as the products or the services that you offer to the customers have got privacy from the day one. It is part of the design of that service. It is part of the architecture of that service. So one of the things that's been mentioned as a technology is homomorphic encryption. I mean, this is still getting applied. There are other forms as well, like format preserving encryption. So homomorphic encryption, what it does is that it doesn't require you to decrypt the data for processing. That's what, that's what it does. So at the end of it, you remain privacy compliance even, even when you're trying to process the data. Oh, that's amazing. I, I didn't know that about this concept. Right. So these are newer technologies that are evolving. That's an area which is very research and development heavy, which would have newer jobs for people to get in newer algorithms, newer areas for people to get deeper in and figure out what could be the areas of development which are very privacy uh, default centric. I'm not gonna be, how much time do we have Prashant? Uh, yeah, we can go for a few more minutes. Uh, how many okay. slides do you have left? I, I, I just have got a few, but I can yeah, make an escalator pitch as well if you want. <laughs> no, no, I think let's not complicate because, you know, uh, uh, I'm sure people can reach out to you on your LinkedIn handle, which I'm going to drop uh, in my Absolutely. podcast. Absolutely. Or, or so, getting so, guidance on, on this, but specific things, simple things is if you want to cover something. Absolutely. Some yeah. I, I won't be covering everything. Um, so we, we got a slide on the PIMS specific uh, subject matter, a couple of more slides. Um, but one thing that you talked about, which is transfer impact assessments, which is a SHREMS 2 uh, ruling that has come in, I think it's 2020 or 21 in the European region. So any kind of data transfers that happen between countries um, have to have a principle of adequacy which is in simple terms, I've got GDPR, it has got three different uh, legal ramifications, uh, four different controls. I'm just taking these numbers, please don't quote me on that. Yeah. Um, but these are, these are hypothetical numbers, but four different uh, clauses to be maintained by your organization, by, by, by the law itself. So a transfer that has to happen, let's say in India, either has to have India following a law which gives the adequacy principle um, satisfaction around what these clauses are versus -vis GDPR. So are these okay. adequate? Oh. Then the transfer would happen to a different region. Hmm. That's what we call as adequacy principle. Otherwise, what happens is it could only happen with the contractual obligations and the clauses between the controller and the processor. So one super set is the adequacy principle, which is between law to a law, the mapping of the controls. Hmm. If hmm. there is no law like in India, then the contractual oblig obligations come in and hmm. then we just have to follow GDPR at the end of oh. it within that contractual obligation. Hmm. So majorly, I, I have taken India as a wrong example. The adequacy principle and the stems to ruling is between European region and the American okay. region. So the data transfer between the two regions can only happen if they have got these adequately covered. That's the principle of adequacy. Okay. Not going to be getting deeper into any of these lawful bases we talked about, purpose limitation we talked about. Quickly, another area wherein people can get think about uh, the next few um, positions, privacy assessments, privacy impact mm. assessments. You know, there's a difference between privacy assessment and privacy impact assessment. Privacy assessment is on organization wide, how is the privacy as a subject matter dealt with? Okay. 
like every process, every service, wherever you are working, how does privacy work out? Privacy impact assessment is something new that has come up. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a law, whether it's a change in your process, whether it's a, it's a new tool that you are trying to adopt, anything that's happening, then there, is a, there has to be a privacy impact assessment for that. Oh, okay. So going back to the one of the slides you showed earlier is India being from draft state in data privacy segment to a legislation state. When it happens, there will be tons of job coming out on the, at least in these two areas to understand the impact of privacy, understand current, current best practices of privacy as part of the organization culture, right? Absolutely. Wow. And that's, and, you know, if you are doing an impact assessment, hmm. any kind of an assessment, it has to be done against a baseline. Yes. Right. When you do that against a baseline, it has to be a law hmm. or it has to be PIMS. Oh, right? Okay. Okay. Yes. Which is, which is the convergence of all the laws. Hmm. Most of the laws in terms of technology that needs to be applied in an organization. These are majorly technical controls. Okay. Okay. So, which means there is another job, which is understanding and running a PIM, right? Or PIMS. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Absolutely. So what's PIMS? As I said, it's 27701 released in 2019. It's about three, three, three and a half years. Hmm. Okay. Um, it's a very detailed guideline. In fact, what it does is it gives you a bifurcated perspective of what does a controller need in terms of uh, the baseline controls and what does a processor need in terms of the baseline controls. Mm -hmm. So controller and processor, somebody who owns the data is the controller, somebody who processes the data mm -hmm. is the processor. So for instance, uh, yes. um, any bank, in the European region, giving its information to be worked out by ASI organization. That's like the bank being the processor, uh, sorry, bank being the controller and the SI, could be any of the Indian I6s, HCLs, Wipros of the mm -hmm. world, mm -hmm. they could be the processor. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it works in conjunction with 27001. So, mm -hmm. Most of the times 27701 is an extension to the ISMS that's already implemented by the organization. Okay, which, which I know most organizations in India are, it's a mandate for them, right? Uh, Absolutely. Okay. And that's what I said, what was ISMS in 2012, 13 for the organizations, PIMS would be in the next year or two. Oh, okay. So. Is there a certification on PIMS available right now for anyone to do? It's uh, well, I that's something which we need to figure out if any of the um, certification training providers are providing that. But there is a certification for the organizations for sure. No, I agree. Uh, for ISMS, <laughs> yes, organization has to be ISO twenty seven thousand one certified. It's mandate uh, if you are a listed company in on the stock exchange for sure. Absolutely. A quick, quick glimpse of the benefits that it provides. Mm. Yeah, just the second one could be interesting. That's what I'm saying. It's a framework of frameworks, which is just demonstration of compliance to various laws, not just one law kind of a thought. And it, it integrates with the information security standard, which because it's an extension to ISMS or ISO 27001. I thought of putting this in because at the end of it, the applicability is where the jobs could be. And I think we discussed this earlier, uh, Prashant, which is around uh, the privacy connotation to the AI, AI ML model training. Uh, so we'll discuss about that. But test data management is a big use case. Um, you know, gone are the days wherein you could just have the replicas of production environments and do the testing on that. Uh, you can't do that anymore because of the privacy specific compliances that various organizations have to follow. They need to make sure that the user data is ID identified or oh, okay. they are synthetically generating the data. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, it's evolved a lot, you know. So I, yeah. I was not following the data privacy side for a few years now, uh, you know, following more on the AppSec and the InfraSec, uh, but this, this 
this seems to have evolved a lot in last few years. Yeah. So test data management is a big use case. Mm. Uh, the way you need to do it in a very secure and compliant way um, would be important for people to understand and possibly uh, figure out what technologies, how, what kind of people are needed for this. Uh, or maybe just an extension to the QA profile now. Um, how how they do it within the organizations. Data discovery, classification, disk attribution is another area. It's a use case wherein, and, and, and this is more, more important for the unstructured data. Right. Because that's like 75 to 78% of the total data that the organizations have. Uh, so discovering that data, classifying, tagging that data and then applying the risk uh, to that data so that tomorrow when the same data comes in, you figure out, and this risk is not cybersecurity uh, predictors only, but it's privacy predictors more so than the cybersecurity predictors. You know, what we talked about user versus uh, protection kind of a thought. Hmm. Um, purpose limitation is a big thing. Uh, I am, I am still to find a tool which could add the purpose to the data collected. I don't know if somebody has already done that. Uh, and more so around the consumer identity management. Okay, going back to the purpose side, right? So the traditional IRM tools, right? Information rights management tool. And there are tools, so example, whenever I'm, I'm creating a document in my organization, I have to define uh, the confidentiality level of that document. It's a it's a mandatory thing now for in my organization, and so that's the sensitivity of the data I'm generating. What 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 do you mean by purpose? I mean, is it so? Example, let's say I'm making a presentation for sales. Okay, is that the purpose? What is purpose? Yeah. Uh, well, imply if you're context? the originator of the document, it's it's easy to define tags, which could even define the purpose for that document or the collateral that you have created, which is on the unstructured side. What I mean by purpose is your data being collected by let's say Google or uh, uh, UIDAI or any, any other organization or a private organization, I shouldn't, I shouldn't take those names because those are, uh, those are a yes. little out of the context. So let's take a bank, I should, they've, they've taken my Aadhaar number. For I, my yeah. I, or possibly I should just take, let's say you go on to a Nike website okay. and you put in your lot of different data. Now mm. that, that data that you have is being given to them for a specific purpose, which was possibly to buy their mer merchandise. Yes. That's the limit of the, the limit of the data that they could use it for. Mm. Understood. That's purpose limitation. Now the technologies have to go on to the level wherein they could stop the organizations to use that data for a purpose which was not told to the user and mm. taken a consent on. Okay. Okay. So now and I, I understand this clearly. Let's say I go to an e-commerce website, I buy merchandise and I have to give my personal address, home address where they can ship this gear. So this, the purpose is set e-commerce goods sale, okay, and shipping. Now, if that organization wants to sell that data to other e-commerce provider, that's, uh, uh, that's against the law, right? Absolutely. And, and I don't know if you follow this, uh, I'm just digressing a bit, but um, this uh, very watched show Shark Tank, right, in India. Yes, yes. I was aghast in one of the episodes wherein one of the sharks said, just collect the data and sell the data. Okay, okay. I'm glad I've not right? seen that. I think yeah. I lost you. So, so, I mean, that's what it is. You don't have a data privacy regulation right now in this jurisdiction of, of India. People can mm -hmm. just do whatever they want after collection of the data. Right, I, you can't leave it to the morality or the integrity of it or the ethics of it. Technology has to come in here. Yes, the purpose limitation on data. You have to tie the purpose to the data, and anybody using it beyond that has to be stopped. Mm. Mm. I don't know how we do it, but that's important. 
right i know i absolutely agree this is this is important and i'm always worried about uh, uh, these organizations taking our data i don't know what they do with it after they have you know uh, solved the the first purpose right and you know absolutely that's what happens right you apply for a credit card with one company and you're, you start receiving calls with 100 other companies right so absolutely yeah, that this, yeah. uh, this purpose limitation will solve that problem for sure by uh, yeah so um another one which we had a quick discussion on which was ai ml model training i mean um the training that happens for the ai ml is it always has pii um and that's where i think the models i think most of them have started working and this was this was like three years back wherein I had this talk wherein I also said that the AI ML trained models which are used in the products, um, if they have to sustain themselves as the technology of tomorrow, would have to work with the privacy as a limitation and figure out what's, what's, what's in it for them to make sure that their models are getting trained rightly and also making sure that the personally identifiable information is just either use for that purpose when consented or they start using synthetic data, right? There are, yeah. there are lots, of, lots of tools available to, to have the synthetic data generation done. Mm. Uh, I, I was in, a, I was in a, an, another talk and I, this, is a, this is a very important aspect to AI ML model training. So it's uh, not related to privacy, but it's important that um, your users may find this useful. Um, if you would think about any kind of AI tools, what we are doing is we are training them with the data of the past for the actions that need to be done in future. Right, right. Right, that's what it is. So Absolutely. any kind of biases that you have in the data of the past would also come in for the actions of the future. I agree. Yes. And that's why I don't trust this historic inference that we are doing on, on this data, right? Absolutely. There's no modern sir. context to it. There's no environmental context to it, right? I can't sir. use the information that was generated 10 years back to make up a forecast or prediction for now, right? I have to have my own context. Yeah, and think about the social structures, the yes. racial biases, the, mm -hmm. the religious biases, any kind of social society specific biases would train, are training your models. And then thereafter, what will happen is if this is the aid on which the human decision-making is being developed for the future, we are getting onto a society wherein these biases would never go. That's where your evolution would stop. Mm. So somewhere, I think somewhere, this is more like a conundrum, which we need to figure out how do we operate at a level which is over and beyond this AI, the chat GPT of the world. Yes. You know, there's this talk of you know, teaching or teachers having problems with this because of the plag plagiarism that the students could do. Yes. And somebody suggesting the 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 assignments have to change completely. Those have to be more made more experiential rather than rote learning. Right. I think somewhere we need to figure out where do we have ourselves placed when the technology takes our place. I agree. I agree absolutely. So, anyways, we come back to the privacy specific thing. Um, I think that's very important. Yes. Um, um, I, I, I'll take one more use case data monetization. Mm -hmm. uh, it's very important. Um, now you've got uh, CDO as a function within organizations, right? Chief data officer. What does he do? At the end of it, he's responsible for a lot of things, including monetization. So you've got a plethora of data, which is with you, but then you need to make uh, an informed decision on the consented data, how could you monetize it in the wider ecosystem? Oh. Not by selling. 
Uh, no, I understand. It's it has nothing to do with, with the commercial side of it, but within the organizations, how do you consume that data by various units to make better decisions which are beneficial for business? Absolutely. Just data analytics. Yes. Better data analytics, mm. data science, mm. and then monetize that data. Yes. Um, data breach management, we talked about a lot mm. at the end of it, whatever is um, protected would have lesser impact in terms of the fines uh, with different regulations, just letting the organizations with the protected data go scot-free. I think that's so important as well. Mm -hmm. That's what I had, Prashant, uh, no, no, this in terms was of the slides. Amazing. So uh, I... Uh, can you stop sh uh, sharing the screen? Absolutely, yes. Okay. So yeah, learned a lot. Now, if I have to summarize for my for my audience, what I understand is there would be a new jobs and roles coming related to data security and data privacy. Data security roles already exist for years. You and I were part of an organization decades back that was into data security, right? And these jobs are still there. Some of our friends are still in data security, right? So they will exist. What I see is evolution on the law side and the compliance side, where they will include uh, roles or, or options regarding data as the, the draft law in India gets more popular. I think lawyers will have to evolve and educate themselves around data privacy, uh, around these technical terms. And that's where I can uh, recommend uh, our uh, audience to, if you are pursuing uh, law, please add that, it's gonna help you. And of course, the tech jobs, right? Tech jobs around uh, data privacy technologies, data security technologies, right? Uh, did I miss anything? No, I think you you were you were you were quite on the spot. Um, you know, some of the things were we getting unraveled with uh, PDPA. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it'll throw out its own opportunities for the audiences. Looking at what's happened in the Western world. Uh, there would be data protection authorities, very statutory government bodies statewide. Mm -hmm. There could be those possibilities coming up. The DPOs within the organizations would also come up. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it's uh, very interesting times. And I keep telling uh, all the young people until there is information, there would be security and privacy yes. of that. So <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, I never thought of that way, right? <laughs> yeah, until this information, you will have information security, right? So let's say, you know, last question would be, let's say I'm a college graduate. I'm, this is my last year. Maybe I'm doing law, maybe I'm doing engineering. If I want to get into data security, where should I start? Should I start reading the laws, documentation, GDPR? There could be terms that are very confusing. What's the simplest roadmap for anyone to start this data security, data privacy learning? Well, I'll, 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 you know, have the segregated into two. Mm -hmm. I would say if you want to go security, then data security is a part of cybersecurity. Yes. So let it be a part of cybersecurity. And then you start with the, uh, with uh, certain articles, certain good trainings that are available on Udemy platforms, uh, you know, e-learning platforms, I should say. And then think about a certification like CEH which is a good way to start things up or, you know, some A plus certification. Yes. I, I don't know about what, what's relevant in security. Mm -hmm. If you want to get then into privacy, getting from there to privacy is all about understanding the additional techno technologies, the technical controls that you need to have to enable privacy in the organization. So then you should be thinking about certifications like CIPT, oh, okay. you got certain sort of uh, experience um, within an organization. If you don't have an experience, then that needs to be built up. Uh, mm. I don't know if IAPP is throwing out an associate level certification, but mm. still a good place to be looking at. IAPP as a, a parent organization would have a lot uh, for you to uncover. But if you're starting things afresh in privacy without the cyber security which becomes understanding the legal aspects of it as well mm. or the compliance aspect very important it. compliance legal aspects of it uh, you, one could build uh, their own careers um, without knowing cyber security as well 
in mm. privacy because there's a very little of cyber security that gets into privacy as as a subject matter um so something to think about two lines to go in cyber security plus privacy privacy only with a bit of cyber security and then reading just privacy okay. as as okay. a legal term yeah that's a good uh, uh, segue oh sorry uh, you know good way of differentiating this so now with that thank you so much vishwameet uh, this was amazing so much uh, new to learn uh, uh, i learned a lot i didn't know data security and data privacy has evolved this much i always found it you know data is data who cares right but i think it's more relevant as we generate more information use more information right uh, so yeah thank you so much uh, we will have well, another uh, session soon thank you absolutely it's, it's always a pleasure prashant um, likewise just 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 call me whenever you have the next one <laughs> <Thank you. laughs>